Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is a portfolio of questions on rural affairs, food and the environment. Um, in order to get as many people in as possible, I'd invite uh, short and succinct questions and answers, please. Question one, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many community groups have received support from the Climate Challenge Fund? Mr Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, over 500, 512 to be precise, communities have now received support from the Climate Challenge Fund to take action on climate change and support um, them making a transition to low carbon living. This is a landmark achievement of national significance and reflects the strength and commitment of community action to tackle climate change. And in total, across these 512 communities, some 696 projects have been funded, with a total of £61.4 million having been awarded. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that response. And I'm aware that Inverclyde is one of the local authority areas that hasn't previously submitted a bid for funding. And I am supportive of the bid from the Greenock Morton Football Community Trust. Can I ask the Minister to look favourably upon the bid which will, have, which will have health and environmental benefits to those who will participate in its activities. Minister. Um, well, I'm certainly delighted to hear that an application from a community in, in Inverclyde area has been submitted to, to Climate Challenge Fund and will be considered at the next meeting in December. Uh, as uh, the member will be aware, Inverclyde is the only local authority area in Scotland that currently uh, is not home to a community uh, which has taken advantage of Climate Challenge Fund. So I'm certainly pleased to hear that the work that's been done locally to try and stimulate interest has paid off. Uh, I understand this particular application has been generated by the Ideas Bank, which is an important new innovation in the fund. And I'm encouraged to see that this mechanism, which is aimed at spreading good practice and making it easy for communities with limited capacity or whose primary focus is not climate change uh, to access fund, is working. All CCF funding decisions, I should say to the member, are made by an independent panel who make recommendations to me. It would therefore be inappropriate for me to, uh, to comment on a particular application in chamber. But I do know that a number of other similar projects based around sports clubs have been supported in the past. Clearly, the decision to fund this particular project will depend on the quality of the application, funds available and, and the other projects they are up against. But I would like to wish this and indeed other communities who have applied to the Climate Challenge Fund in the next 20th round the best of luck. Thanks. Question two, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the livestock haulage industry regarding maximum driving hours and staffing challenges for livestock transporters. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. I am aware of the concerns that the livestock industry has raised on this issue, and of course would be happy to facilitate discussions to help resolve any problems. Of course, responsibility for some of the issues are reserved to the UK Government, and I know that the industry has been making representations directly to UK Ministers. Nevertheless, the Scottish Government does stand ready to work with the industry to help in any way we potentially can. Thanks. So Maureen Watt. I thank Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I wonder then if he has had discussions uh, with his Westminster colleagues on this particular issue. And can he also have a discussion with the Transport Minister and the Cabinet Secretary on training youth and women's employment on the need to bring young people into the industry through apprenticeships, given that the average age of livestock drivers is now over 55. Secretary. Um, I'm happy to commit to doing both of the things requested by Maureen Watts. And, of course, I very much appreciate, as I'm sure member, many members do, the importance of the livestock sector to uh, the, the haulier sector, to the livestock sector generally. Otherwise, simply, we'd not be able to move livestock around the country into market. So we need the livestock haulage sector to, to prosper. And I'll certainly look further into the issues raised by Maureen Watt and take them forward. Thanks very much. Uh, question three, Dave Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government when the details of future common agricultural policy payments to farmers and crofters will be known. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. I did, of course, announce to Parliament on the 11th of June the key decisions on how we will implement the new common agricultural policy from 2015, and in particular for Pillar 1, that's the direct payments to farmers and crofters, which is set to deliver £2.8 billion of payments to them between 2015 and 2020. We are continuing to provide farmers and crofters with a huge amount of information about the new cap through, firstly, the extensive programme of 34 roadshows, which are being very well attended, currently being held right across the country. The CAP booklet we've sent to all customers and the farmers and crofters, which is also available in local area offices. And, of course, we continue to update the Scottish Government's website. Thank you. Dave Thompson. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. I was disappointed that the UK Secretary of State, Liz Truss, didn't uh, let him join her at her meeting with the new Agricultural Commissioner on Monday. But on the CAP payments, uh, I wonder if the Minister is in a position to identify or quantify which areas will be affected by the Area 3 rough grazing payments. One second. Uh, yeah, yes, I share the member's disappointment that I was locked out of the Secretary of State Liz Truss's meeting on Monday in Brussels with the new Agricultural Commissioner, which I did request to attend, but that request uh, was declined. Uh, in terms of the, the member's issue in over rough grazing in relation to the impact on crofters, uh, can I just say that we have written to the crofters to let them have the provisional allocation of the three new cap payment regions based on their 2014 permanent land declarations as part of the, the single application form. So individual crofters will be able to work out what this means for them. Clearly, until we have that worked out and then we have the, the application forms completed uh, next year, we can't estimate the exact payments that any crofter or farmer, for that matter, uh, will receive. Uh, and it is a complex issue, I accept that. But overall, it's worth noting the crofting uh, counties do benefit from the new common agricultural policy that is being put in place in Scotland. In 2011, for instance, crofters received around 19 million euros. Under the new policy, crofters are estimated to receive around 32 million euros. So overall, it's a net benefit for the, the crofting counties in Scotland. Many thanks. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I appreciate the difficulty there is in delivering CAP reform, but how does the Cabinet Secretary respond to comments from NFU that the lack of clarity over the transition to the new area payment system is eroding confidence in the reform process? And also, will he be able to share soon the new transition plans after the European Commission uh, rejected the original transition plans? In terms of the lack of clarity and complexity, I would remind Clear Baker and indeed the Chamber that we worked very closely with the industry throughout the whole reform process. Some of the additional complexity, complexity which uh, perhaps has resulted in a lack of clarity at this stage in the process, it was the result of the Scottish Government meeting the requests of the industry. And we are trying to maximise the flexibilities available within the reform to take into account Scotland's unique circumstances across agriculture uh, and the various issues that are relevant to farming and crofting in this country. So I will give as much clarity and have done already on a range of issues. Uh, clearly, it's a complex process. The first payments will be issued, I remind Claire Baker in December uh, 2015 are closest to that date as we can achieve. Therefore, the, the next few months are important to make sure the process is in place and offer additional clarity. Thanks. Question four, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in developing its low emissions strategy. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we're making good progress in developing our low emissions strategy. Uh, an update on progress will be made at the Scottish Transport Emissions Partnership Annual Conference in Edinburgh on the 18th of November, <coughs> and a draft of the strategy, which is being developed by Scottish Government, Transport Scotland and SEPA in partnership with a range of organisations in the public and private sectors, is due to be issued for consultation before the end of 2014. Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister very much for that reply and look forward uh, to the strategy. Uh, earlier this year, Health Protection Scotland attributed uh, pollution as a cause of death in 306 cases uh, in Glasgow, the highest number in the country. And I note that the draft budget includes uh, no additional funding to tackle the issue of air quality um, improvement. What action um, can the Minister point to which can give me reassurance that this uh, is indeed a priority for the Scottish Government? Minister. Uh, well, we are working very closely with uh, Glasgow City Council, uh, to, obviously the members uh, re represents that area, to produce a comprehensive air quality action plan for Glasgow. Uh, and we have a good relationship with the council in that respect and can provide details by correspondence that would be helpful to the member to, as to what stage we reached. Uh, but we, we know Glasgow City Council has produced a detailed feasibility study uh, and, and did so on reducing, uh, producing a low emission zone in the city for the Commonwealth Games. Unfortunately, that didn't. Uh, take place for, I think, reasons that the member will, will probably be aware of. But uh, the overall, um, uh, we, we are pressed with what Glasgow has been trying to do in trying to tackle air quality issues in the city, and we'll work very closely with them. We have a number of challenges, not least because uh, vehicle emission standards have not delivered the improvement in air quality in urban areas that we had, and indeed 20 other uh, administrations across Europe had, had hoped for. And so uh, it presents us all with a problem, but we are working through a strategy to try and achieve compliance with European directives as soon as we can. Thanks. Question five, Margaret McDougall. Thank you. 
to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on EDF's application to SEPA that would allow it to transport intermediate level radioactive waste from other sites to be stored at Hunterson. Secretary Richard Locke. Um, I should point out, of course, that this application is a matter primarily for SEPA, Scotland's Environment Agency, who are giving it full consideration and, of course, will test its compatibility with Scottish Government policy. Thank you. Margaret MacDougall. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, albeit very short. Many of my constituents are worried that if this application is approved, it would lead to Hunterson being a dumping ground for radioactive waste from across Scotland and beyond. They are also concerned that this waste would be transported on mainly A-class roads, increasing the risk of accidents. Given that the Scottish Government's policy on managing nuclear waste is for it to be stored in near-surface facilities, and I quote, located as near to the site where the waste is produced as possible, end quote. What assurance can the Cabinet Secretary give my constituents that Hunterston will not be used as a dumping ground? Um, I, I, I don't detract from the seriousness of the issues that are raised uh, for a second, but of course I would say that I wish we did not have this nuclear legacy to deal with in the first place. And the Members' Party, of course, has supported uh, that nuclear waste legacy being created in past decades. So, unfortunately, we now have to deal with that in Scotland because that's our uh, responsibility. Seeing that, of course, there has been a public consultation on the application. And EDF have stated that the proposed change is purely a practical one to facilitate more flexible disposals by allowing waste to be collected temporarily at one site before being sent for disposal to an authorised facility. And of course, the application makes clear there would be no long-term storage of waste transfer to Hunston B power station or indeed Torness uh, from another site. But of course, uh, I do treat these matters very seriously and the Scottish Government do have a policy. I'm limited in what I can say because clearly it's an active uh, application. But I hope that puts the issue into context in terms of us do treating this very, very seriously. Many thanks. Question six, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the value of the food industry is to the Scottish economy. Secretary. Uh, the most recent data from 2012 estimates that the food and drink sector, which of course is a growing sector and which includes food and drink manufacturing, sea fishing, aquaculture and agriculture, generated £4.8 billion pounds in gross value added to the Scottish economy. And of course, turnover now is a massive £14 billion pounds overall in Scotland. Uh, there are approximately 118,000 people working in the food and drink industry in Scotland and over 17,000 businesses. So that's approximately 11% of all registered businesses operating in Scotland. Any thanks? Claire Adamson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. He will be aware of a recent Bank of Scotland report showing that the sector is set to create 10,000 new jobs over the next five years, with the 66% of companies surveyed expecting to increase their workforce. Can the Cabinet Secretary highlight what support that the Government is providing in my area in central Scotland to ensure that producers are able to take advantage of the economic potential and the advantages of the quality, reputation and the providence of Scottish food and drink? Well, the Bank of Scotland report that Claire Adamson refers to does underline the massive potential of Scotland's food and drink industry, something I was celebrating this morning at the launch of 2015, the Year of Food and Drink, which will be the big theme for Scotland uh, next year. And it is incredible to meet so many businesses across Scotland, including in Claire Adamson's uh, constituency. They're expanding, taking on new employees and capturing new markets. In terms of support, we continue to make as much support available under tight budgetary conditions as possible. And looking at North and South Lanarkshire for our food processing and marketing grant scheme, we funded, for instance, between 2007-2013, 11 capital projects amounting to £3.5 million, attracting an overall investment of £13.3 million, and also other projects for Borders Biscuits and TM Fresh Direct, etc., um, have been successful. So uh, businesses in Clare Adamson's constituency, as well as throughout the whole of the country, are booming at the current time, and we'll continue to support them in any way we can. Thank you. Claire, Ann. Claire Baker. Well, thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment on the need to bring younger people into the sector and the need to create apprenticeships? When I visit many food and drink industries, such as food, food, um, sorry, fish processing, they find it quite difficult to attract young people into those businesses as it's seen as quite an old-fashioned career and not one that actually offers quite good, good career opportunities. I'm sorry. 
I do recognise that's been a reasonably long-standing issue that uh, Claire Baker refers to. However, I am optimistic that things are changing and the Food and Drink Federation and other bodies such as Scotland Food and Drink are addressing these issues seriously. And I think more and more people are now being attracted into the industry, not just in terms of uh, production, but also the science aspects and the institutes that are dealing with food and drink issues uh, and innovation. So I'm optimistic that more and more young people in Scotland are now being attracted to a successful career uh, in food and drink. Okay, Alex Ferguson, question seven. Um, thank you to ask the Scottish Government how it will use the National Reserve to ensure that farmers who are disadvantaged under the previous common agricultural policy are put on regional average support payments from 2015. Can I say that after extensive discussions with the industry, it is my intention that the National Reserve should cover three categories of farmer. Category one would be for new entrants and young farmers to start farming uh, in 2013 or later. Category two would be for farmers who were not allocated entitlements to the current single farm payment or who were only allocated these entitlements through the new entrant or investor categories of the previous National Reserve in 2005. And the final category would cover farmers who have been subject to force majeure issues. Uh, this approach will immediately address the unfair treatment faced by hundreds of farmers over the last few years, while respecting, of course, the strict conditions contained within EU regulations. It will certainly honour my commitment to give uh, new entrants uh, and include them from day one of, of the new cap, and it is only possible, of course, because the Scottish Government fought for the ability to use the National Reserve in this way. Okay. Alex Ferguson. Uh, all of which is very welcome, but on the 11th of June, in the statement to which the Cabinet Secretary referred uh, to this chamber, he said, and I quote, we negotiated the ability to put those disadvantaged under the old CAP straight onto the regional average through the National Reserve. And he also informed the chamber that he accepted this would mean an increase in the uh, percentage taken for the National Reserve and that key stakeholders accepted this. Now, many of the disadvantaged farmers who have been uh, very optimistic of being, having their problems addressed since that statement are now being told that they won't be put straight onto the National Reserve. They are justifiably angry about this and feel let down. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary quite simply why he appears to have gone back on the words of that statement in June? Uh, firstly, I have not gone back on the word I, I gave in June in terms of those who are excluded under single farm payment, which was established in 2005. Uh, there will be no new entrant farmer who is excluded from the current common agricultural policy. There are issues over the definition of new entrants, and we have looked at the various categories put forward to us and looked at what is possible under the EU regulations, and we are covering all those that can be covered under current EU regulations. And those who were excluded unfairly from the current cap which of course has been replaced from 2015 onwards, will be included in the new common agricultural policy. We can't go against the EU regulations. There are perhaps some issues affecting very few farmers who have expanded since the 1990s. Uh, but in terms of the definition of new entrants, I am confident those that we all feel in this chamber should be included in the new common agricultural policy are going to be included and get the regional average under the new policy. Thank you. Question 8, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the environmental impacts are of fracking and coal bed methane extraction. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, like many other industrial processes, extraction of coal bed methane or the use of hydraulic fracturing for shale gas could have environmental impacts. And we recognise the potential for this, particularly where, where there could be impacts in the water and air environment, as well as other impacts such as noise, visual impact, light pollution and increased traffic volumes. We are also conscious of the potential for increased greenhouse gas emissions if there are fugitive methane emissions from such industrial processes. However, unlike the uh, UK government, we have been somewhat gung-ho, it has to be said. We have taken a precautionary approach. Our stringent system of planning and environmental regulation, which we have further tightened, should ensure any environmental risks are recognised and properly mitigated. The uh, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency has published its regulatory guidance which sets out how it would regulate potential environmental effects of shale gas and coal bed methane development, and this will be subject to regular review based on any new and emerging evidence. Colby, thank you. Coal bed methane extraction is proposed in Cannonbury and Dumfrieshire. This means removing very large volumes of saline water from the coal seam to release the gas. The Scottish Government's own expert panel noted that inappropriate disposal of these fluids in the US has had negative environmental consequences. The water could be removed from Canonby by tanker for treatment, but this puts enormous pressure on rural roads. It could be pumped into the Esk one of our best salmon fishing rivers. It could be left in lagoons or pumped back into the bedrock, which even the expert panel has said has caused small, caused small earthquakes elsewhere. Does the Cabinet Secretary favour any one of these disposal methods? Minister. Uh, 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask the Cabinet Secretary later, but um, I, I understand the, uh, the legitimate, legitimate concerns raised by Joan McAlpine, which I, I fully understand will be shared by uh, some of her constituents in the Canaby area. And we're you know, uh, we are clear that unconventional gas developments can only take place under the highest levels of environmental uh, protection. In this respect, the uh, SEPA has a statutory responsibility uh, for the protection of Scotland's water environment. It has powers <coughs> under the Water Environment Controlled Activities Scotland Regulations 2011 to uh, regulate activities that interact with our water environment, and these duties would be strictly enforced. Um, the appropriate approach is a regulatory matter. Uh, as part of any development that should come forward, the developer must engage closely with SEPA to allow uh, SEPA to ensure that appropriate arrangements are in place uh, to protect the local environment and community. And I will look to ensure our regulation is rigorously applied uh, in order to ensure compliance is achieved. Many thanks. And we now move to portfolio questions on justice and the law officers. Question one. Uh, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on how the legal aid system is operating? <coughs> Secretary Kenny McCaskill. Uh, an essential driver for the Scottish Government policy on legal aid is to have a streamlined system that gives people access to publicly funded legal advice at the right time and addresses budget pressures without compromising access to justice. We've been reviewing and updating our strategy for reforming and protecting legal aid in Scotland as set out previously in A Sustainable Future for Legal Aid, published in 2011. We will publish the outcome of a review activity shortly, and our aim, aim, aim remains to simplify the legal aid system and reduce expenditure while maintaining access to justice. Thank you. And thank, the Cabinet Campbell. thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that the Law Society of Scotland discussion paper on legal assistance in Scotland proposes that criminal legal aid could be increased, possibly by removing funding from some civil cases, for example, housing involving eviction and rent arrears, damaging to vulnerable people, I would suggest. And does he recognise the benefits of not adopting the approach to legal aid south of the border? Absolutely, and I think the members' comments are shared also by Paul Brown of the Legal Services Agency, uh, who made similar comments, I think, in the Herald on Saturday. I should preface matters by saying I do welcome the uh, discussion paper put forward by the Law Society and will be happy to engage with them. But I think the points made by Rod Campbell are comments that we would echo here as a government. We do think that the route that has been pursued south of the border, whereby huge areas and tracts of uh, public life are walks of life are no longer eligible for legal aid is not the way to go. We do wish to ensure that there's access to justice on a broad basis uh, for civil legal aid. Uh, criminal legal aid has to be provided, but it cannot be at the expense of civil legal aid and, in particular, um, a mirroring of the huge cuts that have caused great hardships south of the border. Many thanks. Question two, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to speed up access to domestic abuse courts. Uh, whilst overall levels of crime in Scotland have continued to fall in recent years, the reporting and prosecution of certain categories of crime, including domestic violence, have increased. Victims are now more confident in reporting these crimes, and our law enforcement agencies deserve credit for sending a clear message that such crimes have no place in a modern, fair Scotland. In consequence, our courts are now dealing with increased volumes in these types of cases, which are often complex and require sensitive handling. To assist in ensuring the efficient processing of summary cases, including cases involving domestic abuse, the Scottish Government has presided £1.47 million in additional in-year funding on top of agreed budget allocations to be shared between the Scottish Court Service and the Crown Office. This funding is being used to support additional fiscals, court staff and judiciary. The Scottish Court Service has established specialist domestic abuse courts to deal robustly and effectively with domestic incidents when they arise and to reduce the risk of further escalating violence or abuse. Welcome to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but can I also uh, tell him that at, uh, at meetings of the cross-party group on men's violence against women, concerns have been expressed about long delays in accessing domestic abuse courts and indeed sheriff's courts uh, when domestic abuse cases are uh, still heard there. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that long delays and the postcode lottery of delays are inappropriate for victims of domestic abuse and impact on their safety, and will he therefore ensure that domestic abuse matters are prioritised by the courts? Say. 
for the court service to prioritise, but I can say that I agree uh, with Malcolm Chisholm that uh, uh, justice delayed can be justice denied, and especially when dealing with domestic abuse, it is important that there is prompt and expeditious action. For that reason, that is why the additional funding has been provided, uh, £1 million to the court service and £470,000 to the Procurator uh, Fiscal Service, to ensure that the spike caused, I think it is quite clearly, from the uh, greater uh, involvement across all parts of Scotland by Police Scotland. Uh, the benefits of the single police service have been mirrored, I think, in particular uh, in all forces in all parts of the country taking the appropriate action. That did result in a spike. That did bring pressure, not simply upon the police service, but upon the fiscals and the courts. For that reason, we've put in the additional funding. I welcome the fact that there's now been an extension of the uh, domestic abuse court in Edinburgh to cover all areas of the city and, indeed, areas beyond. And I think what what we will see is that the delays that did come about because of the appropriate and correct actions being taken by the court and the, uh, the police and the Crown uh, will now begin to come down. Thanks. Question three, Colin Keir. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is aware of youth antisocial behaviour in Western Edinburgh, including joyriding and motorcycle theft. Mr Rosanna Cunning. Uh, I am aware of the situation and that tackling youth antisocial behaviour is being prioritised by local police. Fifteen officers have been deployed providing additional assistance and reassurance to the local community and positive steps are being taken to involve all partners and a multi-agency joint action plan is in place to reduce the levels of antisocial behaviour and youth offending. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her reply. Would the Minister agree with me that the actions of Police Scotland, the City Council and local community groups working together in partnership have shown how effective local community policing can be? And while there is uh, undoubtedly more to be done, the fear stories over the breakdown of local policing by some opposition members is unfounded. Mr. Happy to agree with Colin here on this. Partnership working which sees local communities working with, it, with Police Scotland and the local authority it is a very effective way to tackle local issues uh, and to ensure that the public feels safe in their homes and free to go about their business unhindered. And I do support Edinburgh's efforts to reduce offending, including using the whole system approach, uh, preventing, diverting, managing and changing offending behaviour by children and young people. As a result, we've seen the number of children in Edinburgh who've committed offences in the past three years reduced by 28%. Many thanks. Malcolm Chisholm for the action they've taken in the part of my constituency which uh, adjoins Colin Keir's constituency and which the Minister referred to in her uh, first answer. But does she understand, firstly, the great concern and indeed anger of the local community at what has been going on and also the disappointment they feel that sometimes after effective police action it seems that the courts uh, and the children's hearing system uh, let the community down? Does she agree that Individuals must suffer the consequences of their action, and that is an important part of combating crime, as well as the support for individuals and the regeneration of communities, which is obviously necessary as well. Minister? Uh, I think Malcolm Chisholm is, is reflecting probably a, a, a feeling that uh, can uh, become uh, uh, widespread in communities. Um, uh, work with young people who offend uh, via the children's hearing system it uh, takes place on a confidential basis, as Malcolm Chisholm knows. So the extent of intervention may not always be obvious uh, uh, to uh, uh, communities, but that doesn't mean that offending behaviour and its impact isn't being confronted and addressed, and I think it's important for us uh, to reinforce that. And we've also got in place uh, diversionary activities that are being funded through cashback for communities, uh, which uh, um, uh, the member will be uh, widely aware of. Um, sadly, this is not a new problem, and I'm reflecting on the fact that uh, uh, this same issue was being raised uh, very many years ago when I was a local government candidate in Edinburgh. Uh, it tells you how long ago this was when I tell you that Alistair Darling won that election and became the regional councillor uh, for the area. Uh, but it is a reflection, I think, of the enduring difficulties that can arise with this kind of behaviour uh, and the uh, long-term uh, need there is to tackle it at the preventive uh, end rather than at the uh, end of the uh, committing of the behaviour. Hey, thanks. Question four in the name of Gavin Brown has not been lodged. An explanation has been provided. Question five, Nanette Milne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action Police Scotland is taking to address the issue of puppy farms and puppies being imported illegally. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, enforcement of the legislation concerning puppy breeding and import controls on drugs is primarily the responsibility of local authorities rather than the police. Uh, police Scotland, though, will assist local authorities and other enforcement bodies such as the SSPCA when requested. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Um, he will be aware of the concerns which have been expressed regarding the growth in the sale of puppies and dogs online. Following the publication of the Scottish Government's consultation on promoting responsible dog ownership in Scotland, respondents have repeatedly called for indiscriminate breeding of dogs to be tackled and argued that until it was tackled effectively, irresponsible dog ownership would continue. What reforms does the Cabinet Secretary plan to bring forward to address this issue and the sale of animals on internet sites, especially as we approach the Christmas period when many people may be considering buying puppies as presents? Well, the, uh, uh, the policing of the internet, if I can put it that way, is a matter that causes great difficulties, not simply in this issue, but across uh, many areas. Uh, it crosses jurisdictions and, and causes difficulties in terms of other aspects, including not, not simply the internet, but uh, consumer uh, affairs being reserved. What we seek to do is to make Scotland as safe a pace as possible, not simply for humans, but indeed for animals, uh, to tackle what I know is an issue that the member Annette Milne has quite correctly raised. It is quite scandalous. I think initially it was in terms of the transportation from Eastern Europe, much of which was coming in through UK points of entry, and that Scottish police and others work with their UK counterparts. Uh, but clearly people can access both weapons, drugs, and indeed, obviously, uh, puppies over the internet. These are matters that we keep under review. Some of this will be dealt with by my Cabinet Secretary colleague, the Minister for Rural Affairs and, and the Environment, rather than myself. But I'm happy to try and get some information from the member, from both departments and indeed from Police Scotland. I have no doubt they will monitor the internet as they do for all sorts of behaviour. How we can actually properly enforce it until such time it comes here is perhaps harder. But let me reflect upon it and come back to the member with as much information as I can. Thanks so much. Question 6, Dr Lane Murray. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on changes to the workload of officers and sports staff since the establishment of Police Scotland. Uh, this is a matter for the Chief Constable and the Scottish Police Authority in consultation with the staff associations and unions. Uh, this Government is continuing to deliver on our commitment to put 1,000 additional police officers in communities where recorded crime is at a 39-year low. Dr Murray. Uh, on the 4th of November, Chief Superintendent Niven Rennie of ASPS told the Justice Committee that he had real and significant concerns about the workload of his members and that the number of superintendents had reduced considerably through reform. Stephen Diamond of Unison told the committee that there are real pressures on staff to perform and fill in the gaps that have been left by people leaving or by roles not being filled. Now, I know the Cabinet Secretary likes to say this is an operational matter for the police, but this was, this was legislation passed by this Parliament, brought in by him. Does he have any responsibility and what is he going to do about it? Well, it was brought in by me, it was passed by this Parliament and it was, I think, supported by the member who had also uh, clearly campaigned, as had been Labour's position, for a single police uh, service. Uh, I think, as we've heard earlier, the Police Service of Scotland is now doing a remarkably good job, as indeed the legacy forces also did, and we've heard the outstanding work causing pressures in other aspects of justice uh, in terms of tackling domestic abuse. Uh, the Chief Constable has been clear that there will be no routine backfilling. Uh, I will be meeting with Niven Rennie shortly and indeed with Stevie Diamond, as I do on a regular basis. There are financial pressures for Police Scotland, indeed for every public sector and indeed private sector authority in Scotland. These challenges come from us not having control of our own budget. Uh, that has implications for us. Equally, those who work in it or those who require to lead it, I think, are rising to the challenge and doing an outstanding job. Thank you. Question 7, Hanzala Malik. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is in holding a public inquiry on historic child abuse allegations. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Um, Hansala Malik may be feeling rather overtaken by events, and no doubt he will have been in attendance at yesterday's statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. The Cabinet Secretary gave his assurance that we will reach a decision on whether a further public inquiry will be convened by the end of this year after we have had an opportunity to listen very closely to views on all sides of the debate to ensure that the action taken is well informed and meaningful. Thank you. Hans Alan Malik. Uh, I thank the member for his response. Although my question was submitted before the child protection statement yesterday, I would like to reiterate really gravity of the issue. 
Holding a public inquiry on historic child abuse allegations would assure the public that the calls for justice made by the victims will be properly addressed rather than feeling disregarded. Scotland needs to take a deep look uh, into the future, both the child protection system as well as the legal system, and therefore I press on the Minister to look at this issue and on also ensure that a public inquiry is carried out as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I, I think the member will agree with me that what is incredibly important, and we only need to think about what's happening uh, um, uh, at Westminster at the moment with their public inquiry, uh, I, I think he will agree with me that what is incredibly important is that we get this right from the start. And it is our intention that we will consult uh, uh, with survivors uh, about all aspects of what kind of inquiry might be required uh, and also who might be sitting uh, on that inquiry. And I think it's very important that we do that and understand very clearly whether the kind of inquiry that may be being asked for is manageable in terms of uh, the whole process. Uh, I have indicated uh, the commitment of this government that a decision will be made on that uh, by the end of this year. How time limited one can make that inquiry is a different question entirely. Many thanks. Question eight, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to establish domestic abuse courts across the country. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill. Uh, there are already a number of established domestic abuse courts across Scotland in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Falkirk, Dunfermline, Livingston and Ayr. Uh, Sheriff principals are responsible for court programmes including domestic abuse courts and under their legislative duty they are tasked to ensure the efficient management of cases in their sheriffdom. And while Scottish ministers have no locus of control over court programming, it is worth mentioning that the Domestic Abuse Toolkit to aid the development of specialist approaches to cases of domestic abuse published in 2008 was prepared following initial evaluation of the dedicated court in Glasgow, and that toolkit was developed to aid sheriff principals and local criminal justice partners. Rhoda Grant. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Obviously, I would wish to see domestic abuse courts ro rolled out throughout Scotland because I think that would help victims um, be able to address the crimes that were perpetrated against them. However, in the interim, will he look at grouping cases together and encouraging uh, the Procurator Fiscal Service and indeed the justice system um, to pull those cases together to build expertise within uh, the Criminal Justice Service and within the Procurator Fiscal's um, office so that people understand domestic abuse and the sheriffs that are presiding over those cases have a deeper understanding of the issues in front of them and deal with them appropriately. Uh, absolutely. I think the member makes a very fair and valid point. I think, to be fair to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, they have sought to ensure that these cases are, wherever possible, dealt with and marked by specialist domestic abuse sheriffs, uh, domestic abuse fiscals. Equally, it is also the case that sheriff principals uh, have tried to ensure that where there is not a specialist court, uh, that we um, uh, bring together those particular cases, do it on set days, try to do it with uh, uh, sheriffs who build up that expertise. It's the same matter that's also been dealt with in, in terms of dealing with young offenders. It's not so much the building that matters. What matters, and I always recall these points being made by the former Lord Advocate Ailey Angelini, it's how we deal with them. Having people who are properly uh, knowledgeable and able to deal with it, whether in terms of being fiscals or indeed with being the, on the, the bench, uh, making sure that we deal with it as expeditiously as possible, a point raised correctly by Malcolm Chisholm, making sure that we cluster them together, uh, making sure that we have got the resources in court in those days, both with social work, Scottish Women's Aid and other agencies. So I think I can give the member the assurance the point she made makes is well made. It is one, though, that is taken on board by both Crown and Scottish Court Service, and it is one that I am happy to drive home to them is important and is a point being raised in Parliament. Thanks. Graham Pearson, question nine. President officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it will bring forward proposals to tackle revenge pornography and what timescales will apply. Well, we've confirmed that we're looking actively at the issue of revenge porn and we'll set out how this will be taken forward very soon. In the meantime, prosecutors have confirmed that there are a number of existing offences through which people who engage in this criminal behaviour can be prosecuted. Pearson. Uh, President officer, I'm grateful for that reply. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether he or his officials have had discussions with the Scottish Police Authority uh, 
around the nature of any additional resources or additional finance that might be required to deal with this issue? Uh, not specifically on this issue. I met with Vic Emery uh, very recently. That was regarding the police budget in the round. It does seem to me, from discussions though with Police Scotland and indeed with the Crown, uh, what we're talking about here is having a better law to deal with circumstances that are ongoing that are entirely unacceptable. The point quite correctly made by the Lord Advocate, supported by us, also supported by agencies, whether Scottish Women's Aid or others, is that we know that this type of behaviour is ongoing. It's unacceptable. There are already existing offences that can be and indeed are used to correctly prosecute people, but a specific law, uh, law on revenge porn would make matters clearer, uh, would be of assistance to police and prosecutors, and on that basis we seek to drive it forward. I think this is about making the law better and clearer, not necessarily about, not, uh, about uh, increasing the costs. Many thanks. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11.